Film composers are given an almost impossible task, create a memorable score that resonates with an audience but isn't so effective that it steals the show. Join us as we sit down with five of this year's most accomplished composers. On this episode, we have Marco Beltrami, The Homesman, Danny Elfman, Big Eyes, John Powell, How to Train Your Dragon 2, Trent Reznor, Gone Girl, and Hans Zimmer, Interstellar. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, The Composers. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, The Composers. I'm Kevin Cassidy, and I'm here with Hans Zimmer, John Powell, Marco Beltrami, Trent Reznor, and Danny Elfman. Thank you for being here. I'd like to know what, uh, in the last year, musically speaking, you really, really wrestled with. What was the riddle you had to solve that kind of raised the anxiety level and really kept you awake at night? John? Well, you mean just generally musically or on Dragon? No, how about on Dragon? Yeah. On Dragons. Um, we were just trying to come to terms with the fact that I was getting old, the characters were getting old, and my style was getting old, um, I think. So I just had to be happy with the fact that I was sounding really old-fashioned and, you know, leitmotif and weirdly kind of 19th century themes and folk music from the 60s. And uh, I used to be hip, apparently. And uh, now I'm this old fart that, uh, that does only orchestral music and writes tunes, so. Are orchestral scores old fashioned now? No, I, I, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a factor of, you know, I, I've done a lot of hybrid scores in the, in the past, you know, and I suppose I, I had a reputation for, you know, a while back when I was young for doing things that, you know, didn't have too much orchestra. And that was often, it's kind of budgetary actually. I mean, mm -hmm. Bourne was not very orchestral because they'd already had a score and they'd spent all the money. So we didn't have enough money. So I was told no orchestra, you know, until the last minute, and then they found a little bit of extra for strings. In this case, we already had the example of the first movie, so I kind of knew where I was, but because everybody in the film grew up, I thought maybe the music should. So I kind of delved into a lot of the language that had, you know, called on from my history, you know, classical music that I loved. You know, Sibelius and Nielsen and sort of Scandinavian composers, Russian composers. Mm -hmm. And I just allowed myself to just go into it a bit more deeply. And, and, and you look around and you go, okay, well, everybody's doing hip scores and everybody's kind of got some interesting things going on. And, um, you know, <laughs> here I am sort of making it sound more old fashioned. This is Burke, the best kept secret this side of, well, anywhere. Granted, it may not look like much, but this wet heap of rock packs more than a few surprises. <laughs> Life here is amazing, just not for the faint of heart. You see, where most folks enjoy hobbies like whittling or needlepoint, we prefer a little something we like to call dragon racing. Old fashioned, I suppose, is, you know, is, is relative. It's whatever's going on at the time. Um, and it just seemed to be right at the time. So I, I, got, I got used to the idea. But it took a while. I had to kind of get over. I think it was about being 50 right at the time when I was trying to write the film. So you had a midlife crisis. I did, I did, with... right in the middle of the film. You know, it was fun in the end. So. Yeah. Don't worry, honestly, I'm not, I'm not that you know, worried about it. Okay, good. Marco? Um, we were inventing things for uh, the project that we were working on. Um, this is the Homesman? For the Homesman. And um, I was afraid that we would never get to actually uh, get the project done. I mean, there was some concern, where's the music and all that. But I was fixated on building this instrument up on the hill, uh, this piano, and also um, these harmonic guitars. And, but it all takes time and, and this trial and error. And then you have to wait for the wind to be right. And it's hard to tell, you know, I can't do it now because we're waiting for the wind. So, um, <laughs> much of being a sailor is being a composer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, it was um, it was sort of a new way of working for me, um, and just not being sure I was going to be able to produce the ideas that I that I heard. My name is Cuddy, Mary B. Cuddy. 
Where's Mr. Cuddy? I live uncommonly alone. What's the job? Three women in this country have lost their minds. Their husbands can't care for them properly. You and I are going to take them back across the river to Iowa. I need someone who can hunt and guide and help with the animals on the trip. It's your job, and you sworn to do it. That's why I set you free. Three crazy women for five weeks is a lot more than I bargained for. Perhaps you don't realize what a grand thing you're doing taking these poor, helpless women home. If you don't, I assure you, I do. This might be the finest, most generous act of your life. You'd never really attempted this before on any no. other project? Yeah. Why, why on this project? Well, because the picture to me suggested, um, you know, it's all about these women going crazy, living on the, on the frontier. And the thing that makes them go crazy is among other things, it's summed up by the wind. Mm. So I thought it's such an important component to the, to, the, to the film. There's gotta be a way to make it a musical idea and, and be able to, I really wanted to be able to tune the wind and make it as a musical element. And that would be my starting point. But you know, it, it, um, it was a question of me and Buck who works with me in the studio, um, spending a lot of time just researching and trial and error and you know, trying to find people that could sell us piano wire and all kinds of stuff. So. Well, it works because the score is really, really great. Oh, thank you. Danny, what did you struggle with on um, Big Eyes? Um, I'm not gonna be able to add much to this table. I mean, no, it really wasn't. My year wasn't a year of insomniac contrasts, but Big Eyes in itself was a really little movie. It was a tiny film. Uh, approach was tiny, small orchestra, think small. And uh, so I don't have a lot to add other than, you know, my year was more about things, you know, films are like icebergs. You know, you, they, you have them at a certain point where they all look like they're all in a row and then they all start to move, they start to flow. And suddenly there's, uh oh, this is crunching into this and now I'm stressed. And so my year was kind of a year of stressful, trying to avoid catastrophic collisions and make them elegant. Um, but Big Eyes itself was uh, of, it was more like going backwards in time. This was my 16th film with Tim. And we started out really simple. It's just like, do anything and don't care about it. And nobody cares what we're doing. And then it became more expectations and the films got bigger and more pressure to come up with results. And, and uh, this was almost like going back to I don't know, Pee Wee's Big Adventure or Beetlejuice or something and so far as it, once again, it's like nobody seems to be watching or there wasn't that sense of expectation. He didn't want it to sound like his other scores. He wanted to take, think small. So I, I feel like small at this table, you know, having done this small film with small expectations and uh, everything about it was just little. So I'm just setting the mood. Waiting for the muse to strike. Well, your muse has 58 minutes. It does sounds different than a normal Tim Burton score. Yeah, he didn't want it to get into the fantasy mm -hmm. uh, side uh, that he's, you know, so often explored. And um, he, he had very definite thoughts about this should be like this and this should be like this. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, it's just following the rhythm. You find the rhythm of a director. I mean, there are disadvantages and disadvantages to being with a director that you know really well. I mean. Uh, on the one hand, you can kind of fall into a rhythm where you, you understand what they might be looking for and, and uh, it, it makes sense. And the other hand, sometimes, you know, not knowing what the director is like and what their expectations can, you know, that, that's a whole mm -hmm. kind of a beautiful thing unto itself because you, you just have no idea what they're going to do. So in this case, I knew enough of his rhythms to know that once I started falling into certain grooves, this is what's kind of getting to him. He's not, you know, Tim never says he loves any piece of music I've ever written. It's just, he's either pulling his hair out, which is a bad idea, or he's looking pensive, and that's good. And he'll nod maybe a little bit, 
and go, okay, that's good enough. After 29 years, um, we're go. <laughs> and so uh, I just look for where the hair stops getting pulled, and then I know we're okay. Yeah, well, that's uh, interesting. Do we, um, so if a director was really effusive with praise, are you, does that concern you? Well, anybody gets effusive with praise. I want to disappear very quickly. It makes me want to hide. <laughs> are you guys, are you the same? I mean, how do you, when the director reacts, what's that like? What is, what is it like when the director first hears the music and you get a reaction? You know, as Danny said, I'm suspicious immediately of any sort of, if it sounds too good, like I want to fo focus in on the negative. You know, if there's a hundred reviews and what's one of wrong? them is bad, that's the one that I'm paying attention to. Uh, I know David quite well and we, we have a similar kind of uh, mindset towards that, so we've, we've got a rhythm where he, he's careful to critique, but I know when we haven't hit it right, you know, when we get it right, there's usually a pretty glowing response that, that, that feels good, and then I know it's genuine coming from him. What did you struggle with on Gone Girl? The struggle with Gone Girl revolved around boxing myself into a schedule. Everything had been planned out. A couple of years ago, we knew that David's next film was going to be a different film that would have started right, right now. I booked a uh, tour with Nine Inch Nails, which was going to eat up almost all of this year. And once that tour was booked and went on sale, then I got the call saying, hey, uh, that other film fell through. Now I'm going to do Gone Girl. And it's going to land exactly on the tour you just booked. Um, so it was either pass, which I wasn't going to allow that to happen, or try to find a way to fit that into any time there was a week off here, or any moment to kind of to address working on the score. And I approach these projects, films, with a great sense of uh, insecurity. You know? And I, make, I try to make up for that by just an enormous amount of work I can throw at it, you know, to make up for um, what might be dead ends or wrong directions. You know? I don't have the confidence to know I can just whip this out in X amount of time. So it added a level of tension. So we, we'd, uh, Atticus Ross and I, we'd have, um, we start at the beginning of this year, there'd be two to three week intense com composition session and then be away from it for six weeks and then come back, day at, back from tour, right in the studio. Um, and I think in hindsight it might be justification now, but it, it did provide an objectivity that I, I normally wouldn't have, where I would just grind it out and think about it. And we were talking about insomnia, suffer from that through the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, I think it wound up being a good thing, but it made the process a bit anxious throughout, where I always felt like, you know, if, if there's one wrong turn, I could screw this up without the luxury of time to, to fix things. Because it would have, yeah, yeah, you would have just run out of time, right, Larry? Yeah, like... it, it forced my hand to, there wasn't a lot of room for misdirection, you know. It just added a level of tension that I can hear in the music, which may be a good thing, but it wasn't as enjoyable in some ways, because you always felt like this has to be done by this time. Amy lost a lot of blood in there. Then somebody mopped it up. Why do they mop up the blood if they're trying to stage a crime scene? Whatever they found, I think it's safe to assume that it's very bad. I finally realized I am frightened of my own husband. I would draw you, because if you do a deposition, what to say, what not to a say. A trained monkey? A trained monkey who doesn't get lethal injections. She's going to eat you alive. You assaulted her? It's not good enough for you? I hit her? It's not even close. Absolutely not. I never touched her. We now believe Nick is involved in the disappearance of our daughter. Without a body, without a murder weapon, their only hope is a confession. I don't know anything yet. You need to tell me. How was your marriage, Nick? Are you asking me if I killed my wife? Man of my dreams. This man of mine may kill me. What about my son, Nick? This man may kill me. In her own words, this man may kill me. On the previous projects, you had far more time? Particularly Dragon Tattoo, we just took the whole year and said, let's... let's go crazy. Let's make it also a study on um, exploring different soundscapes and different methods of doing things. Like what, what I've found, Atticus and I talk about this a lot, where in our workload of things we take on, whether it be a Nine Inch Nails record or other things, that seems in my past when I was young, I had time to learn every piece of gear and explore every option and, and that feeling of a mastery of something where I could extract all kinds of sounds out of a limited set of stuff. And I found just by the way I kind of fill my time with projects that a lot of times I'm using tricks I know how to do 
you know, and I, I kind of have an idea of what I'm doing, but I, I never go in the, what we'd call in the lab and just go crazy experimenting what happens. So we used uh, Treg and Tattoo, we kind of turned that into lab time and also composition because we, we didn't book anything else. And, and, and that has its merits, but also has, is, is another form of insanity that can come up. Yeah, when you, I ask composers what they'd rather have more of, money or time, they always say time. They're lying. <laughs> <laughs> in my case, I, I, I don't think there was a lot of anxiety. It was just playfulness. Um, obviously, Interstellar, and um, when a director says, you know, is there a way in music you can sort of consolidate the different theories of uh, time, gravity, and <laughs> things like that, <laughs> you know, in, in some sort of poetic way, um, it keeps you up at night. That sounds like a major but, challenge. No, it's, well, it's a game. It's a game. It's, it's, is it always a game, or was it just a game on this particular project? Um, I have to say this project was sort of so delicious. It was so nice. I mean, the whole workflow, the whole... I was very protected as well by Chris. Um, mm -hmm. He just, you know, I could just go and express my ideas or whatever I wanted to try out, we could try out. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the whole way we worked was, it was just one long, great experiment. Just keep the lab doors open and go for it. We must confront the reality that nothing in our solar system can help us. Now you need to tell me how much plan is to save the world. We're not meant to save the world. We're meant to leave it. And this is the mission we were trained for. I've got kids, Professor. Get out there and save them. You have no idea when you're coming back. I don't know if you know the story of how we started Interstellar. I do, the watch. The, no, the... Or the, the letter. letter. The letter, yes. Um, I know, Chris gave me this watch and at the back it says, very small, this is not a time for caution. <laughs> <laughs> I'd run into Chris about two years ago. He said, if I gave you one page but wouldn't tell you what the movie is about, would you give me one day and just write whatever comes to you? Oh, sounds like a fun experiment. So... He gave me this one page, typewritten, old typewriter, thick paper, so I knew there were no carbon copies. And it was just this fable, really, about what, you know, a, a being a parent. And there were a lot of things in it. Really. He knows me pretty well. There were lots of things which we had sort of talked about over dinners. Um, so I wrote him the, you know, sat down, wrote the piece, phoned him up Sunday, 9.30 at night. And I said to him, do you want me to send it over? And he goes, no, no, can you come down? Came down, I played it to him. And this is like the praise thing in a funny way. So I said, you know, I'm nervous playing things to people, especially when they ask me to write about something very personal. So I sort of looked at him and went, so what do you think? And he goes, I suppose I better make the movie. And then I said, what is the movie? Um, and, and, and that was a good way to start because it was, you know, it was very small. I mean, then he told me, oh, it's this huge epic space and all these sort of things. And I actually, somewhere while he was explaining the physics and the everything to me, I said, hang on a second, but I've only written you this tiny little fragile theme. And he goes, yeah, I know where the heart of the story is now. So it was a good way to start. And it was, and by starting differently as well, it meant, you know, talking about experimentation. I mean, last summer, two years ago, um, you know, I just locked myself away and just was doing exactly the thing that you were sort of missing, you know, getting to know the toys again and get, getting really into the technology and really learning things, mm. learning things, which is mm. great. I love doing it. That's the way it should be. That's the real spirit of collaboration. Yeah, yeah that sounds like a really ideal situation. Right? And we have this weird way, we sort of work in parallel where I write music while he's shooting, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't really see the picture. I mean, that, that's literally there's one scene where he's, I think he was in Iceland. I was in London, and he's describing what well, needs to do this, and then it needs to do this, and da -da. I'm going. I don't listen. I don't think I can do that. I think I better have do this to picture. And he goes, "Well, over the years we've been pretty good. We feel tempo, or we feel drama, sort of the tempo of drama, in a fairly similar way." He said, "Just give it a go. Just write it, and if it doesn't fit, we'll, you know, get you a picture." Um, and I wrote it, and I sent it over to him, and phoned him, and he said. Uh, no, no, it hit every cut. I mean, it's frame accurate. 
So it's still, and then he actually said, you know, that after he had said to me, well, no, 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 we're, we're pretty good. We feel tempo fairly similarly. He, he sort of, once he hung the phone up, he went, oh, I was a bit reckless. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a nice way of working. I, I have a feeling all of us in a funny way have this thing here where, you know, we like working with directors who see music as having an autonomous role you know, not being a slave to the picture. What happens if uh, um, the director doesn't like what you've just played for him? Um. It's never happened to you. Has that ever happened to you? Somehow I get the sense that that's, that's almost better. Better? <laughs> way. Well, no, it's guys, not better. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm trying to figure out, because you don't, you don't like effusive praise, but you don't want them to... No, you don't want... Not wanting effusive... To, not wanting to be bullshitted or have effusive mm -hmm. praise is far different than not I don't like what you did. Place. Right. Because okay. no matter what you do, you've put a lot into it. Right. And that first moment of playing the first thing back is the most frightening moment of mm -hmm. anything yeah. I can think of. I, I can't think of anything I am more terrified of still than the first time playing something. I so, so agree. And it never goes away. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Never doesn't goes get away. better. <laughs> it, it doesn't. Uh, 16 <laughs> films with him and it does, it's not better. Uh, I'm terrified yep. of playing the first playback for him. What, so, what's yeah. interesting is that you actually perceive your own music differently when somebody, like really? the director or somebody's in the room, and he's so conscious of every nuance that, that's going on with them. So, I, at least I am. I'm yeah, so no, like the ears yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like you're hearing it uh, differently while you're in the yeah. room with somebody else? Yeah, you almost like hear it. And then if there's something that's problematic, uh, it, sometimes you can almost anticipate it. Like, I, it, I don't know, it's strange. I agree with that. It's, it's a strange thing, even if I'm working on an album and I've got 15 songs and I, I need to trim it down to 12 and I've agonized over what's the weak link. If I have a friend come in and listen, I don't even have to look at what they're, if they're, if they're in the room, I immediately know that's, that has to go. That's the weak, that's the bad one or that's the good one. There's a clarity that comes from. Exactly, yeah. I don't know what it's like, if it's similar with you guys, but I, there's a balance as you're getting attached to something and the director hasn't heard it yet. Uh, if you wait too much longer, you're going to get really attached to it. And then you might play it and the director might go, no, 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 that's the wrong thing. And then you're devastated, but you don't want to play it too early, but you don't want to get so attached. You have it living with it solo so long that you run the risk of like really getting into it. And then it can just go evaporate in a Politics. quick second like a, Politics like a bubble. Of, uh, figuring, <laughs> yeah, what do you, what do, you do if you, if you feel very strongly about something? and the director doesn't, how far do you take that, that fight? I mean, if the director can, I think if he can articulate the, the reasons, like what it is, and I can articulate and we're able to have, with Tommy it was very much like that. I mean, because one of the great things about working with him is that he doesn't use a temp score. Um, you know, he's all about, it's an open slate, I want creativity and originality, which is all great and fine, but if, I, I know he has some sort of mindset about what, the picture's about, and if the music's not gonna fit into that, then there's a problem. But if he can articulate what it is, and I can respond to it, then I'm happy to work on it. You know, if, if, if it becomes an impasse where you can't see what they're going after or whatever, then I, I mean, there's a certain point where you have to walk away, I guess. Um, how do you guys decide on the overall sound of the score? There was some interesting you know, there was a xylophone in Big Eyes, is that what I was hearing? Marimba. Marimba and an organ, right? And a strange piano of some kind outside in uh, Holmesman. <laughs> How do you decide that you're gonna go with this kind of instrumentation? For me, the whole thing is um, trying to um, sort of distill the essence of the picture to the most simple element from which uh, you know, almost like an acorn of a tree, and then when it sprouts out, you know, hopefully the, the music from the picture will all be derived from a similar area, something. Um, so finding that element is key to me, maybe just as a idiosyncrasy for how I work, um, but um, 
it keeps me organized and focused on where I am and where I'm going and what I'm trying to do. Uh, so, Hans, what about you with the organ? Where well, did that come from? with us, it was actually sort of a two pronged approach. One was, you know, we, we'd spent nearly 10 years on the Batman movie, sort of developing a certain sound, and that sound had sort of seeped into the zeitgeist of a lot of other movies. So we just went, okay, let's not do anything that we did on that. Let's take some colors out of our crayon box. So no action-y strings, no thundering drums, none of this. Woodwinds, let's have woodwinds, loads of woodwinds. And, but, and the organ thing, that was really like a Chris, you know, the way we talk about music, we don't actually really talk about music. We're always on story. We're always talking about the story. And somewhere in, the, in, in this talk about the story, and, which was really about celebrating science, celebrating scientists, um, Chris was talking about how movies had become more and more internal and psychological. We wanted to do something which was looking outwards and upwards. And this idea of truly celebrating science, and, and one of the things we started to talk about was obviously musical instruments. And Chris at one point sort of mentioned pipe organs. And if you think about it, I mean, by the 17th century, they were the most complex machine that man had ever created. And they sort of held that pole position of complexity until the telephone exchange was invented. And, you know, if you think about the way they look as well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, they look like afterburners on a, on a spaceship, you know. So, um, plus it just, seemed, it, it just seemed fun to try to explore this. I mean, here, here, we, were, here we were doing the sort of, we were doing a science fiction movie, but everything we were, we were working with was organic and was sort of constantly keeping that thought in mind, you know, is, is to try to go to the most excellent place that, humanity can give you to, mm -hmm. to go to extraordinary musicians, to use extraordinary devices, to figure out how to, you know, record them in, in, in extraordinary places and record them really well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I had to spend, you know, a lot of time actually, you know, like, like all of us, you know, I had to spend a lot of time working out how these things worked because, you know, you can't just turn up and go, okay, switch it on, here it is, you know. It's a beast. It really is. Uh, Trent, would you would you see yourself writing a big orchestral score sometime? I, I'd love to have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was appropriate for the for the film. You know, um, the little bit that we dabbled in on Gone Girl was more just uh, accessorizing a bit. You know, there was a few passages that we were working on that sounded like it might be interesting to see what would happen if a room full of people were playing it. That afforded us a day to um, experiment after we tick that one box of the need that we had, then we had several hours to kind of really open my eyes to the possibilities, you know, that I hadn't really had access to in my world. Um, so yeah, I would like to try that as the... <laughs> I'm, I'm, we divided this, you know, very much what you're talking about, we divided the scope very precisely into, okay, these are the things we need to record. This is the, as, as written on paper. And that sort of was one third of the session. And then two thirds of the sessions, we literally, you know, there's that thing where the conductor stands up above the orchestra and speaks down to them. So we thought, oh, but let's just reverse it. Let's just sit down, be at eye level, and let's just have a chat with the musicians. And, you know, ask the bassoon player, come on, there must be one noise that you love to make and nobody ever lets you play. Let's hear it, you know? so. so find out, literally treat them as individuals as opposed to the orchestra and yeah. sort of make them co-conspirators in the whole thing. You guys often talk about ideas, like finding the idea that leads you to all these other decisions. Where It doesn't make any sense to me because I'm not a musician. It seems like inspiration is the thing that you're looking for. Where, how do you find the idea that's going to guide you down the right path? How do you do that? It's all the laboratory, like Trent was saying. Um, I have X number of weeks in the lab. I, unfortunately, um, I'm hearing Hans talk about his experience and uh, it sounds so wonderful. My experience is kind of the antithesis because Tim doesn't talk about his movies at all. He doesn't want to talk about them. He just shows me the movie and I'm off to the laboratory. Until there's music to play, he doesn't even want to discuss it. So I'd love to uh, know what that's like Sometimes, <laughs> and, and I shouldn't say, by the way, that he never says anything good about the music, because when we're recording it, he gets very funny and he gets very positive. But it's laboratory time, and it's trying everything 
but the kitchen sink. I, I hate to make it sound so absurd, but coming up, how did I find the marimba? It was one of dozens of things that I'd done. One of them happened to be a marimba. There was no reason whatsoever other than I played those dozen things for Tim, finally biting my nails, and he goes, oh, I like that. And he made a mental note, likes the marimba. And uh, marimba's in. There was no intent of other than one night, I have a lot of marimbas in my studio. I'm kind of a percussionist. <laughs> I, I uh, started with percussion. Um, there was an early point where I wanted to be a, an ethnic percussionist, and I thought I was going to, that was my life was being. So now I have a, a loft full of marimbas. And so it was naturally that one of the things I did should be <laughs> on a marimba, and it was that, that random. Mm -hmm. But it's all the laboratory time is like trying everything, and then it focuses down to fewer and fewer things, and then eventually the director comes in, and you know it's like, this is what I'm hearing, and everything else is gonna fall by the wayside, and then the laboratory time stops because the clock says you are not allowed any more time, and that's the end of it. I, I, I'm making it sound absurdly oversimplistic, I'm sorry. What's your routine like when you're working on a project, John? Do you have a set routine? Well, like wait yes. at a certain hour, work for certain hours, etc. So if I have three months to do it, the first month I don't. Then this, <laughs> then the second. But you think month, about it. yes. Well, actually, I I think it's about thinking month. about it. You think yeah. about thinking about getting started. And then the second month, you kind of you you get really worried because you're running out of time now. You've taken the whole third and got this happens every time oh yeah absolutely every okay. single time you know and it got worse i would say the numbers it used to be i would spend two weeks not avoiding you know when i first started with him it was like you know and he'd come and shout at me so i'd <laughs> you know I'd, I'd get on with it you know but now i'm on my own as it were i i, I don't have anybody to shout at me really, do you want so me to come by i might need you yeah. <laughs> i might need you so yeah but it's it's a it's a it's a fear because it's a huge great load of music you've got to suddenly produce mm -hmm. i'd say the the definite advantage is is that if you're, if you're with a filmmaker who, who can construct a film that's really well constructed, you get a lot. I mean, I think that's amazing about what Hans did, because he, even though you know, Chris Nolan is a great filmmaker, he didn't give you anything, so you were basically kind of going off paper. And, I, and I'm, I've been there where we, you know, it's just you have to play to try and find what, those vo what the voice of the, of the movie asks for. And it, it's always between you and the director and the filmmakers, all the filmmakers sometimes, because somebody can not like something you're doing from the studio and you can't just ignore them. You have to, you have to try and take into consideration all the voices, you know, because otherwise they, it's gonna come back and bite you in the ass later. But all these people are gonna kind of, are gonna say things, your playtime gets adjusted, gets, things get picked out and then you have a style. In this particular case, I got lucky because it was on a sequel and sequels are great and they're very hard sometimes, very much easier. So this time I knew the tone, I knew that you know, everything that was going on in the movie had already been kind of established, it just had to mature. And I had a filmmaker who'd constructed a story that was so precisely done, and I could see it exactly. I mean, it wasn't just in conversations beforehand, you know, a year before, it was literally the first time I saw the film. Everything was there. So then it was just about sort of stitching together the music so it, it, it you know, adhered as closely as it could to this perfectly constructed, you know, a narrative mm -hmm. and made sure that structurally it was all in place and that, that, that kind of made it easier but the process is always to be frightened because you know there's nothing in your future other than failure here's, and, here's a good motivator yeah, so, <laughs> and eventually you run out of time and your adrenaline is so high that you, you start right you have no choice no. Yeah. Yeah. well the, I mean I think that's why I'm very lucky with Chris who really sort of tries to protect me I mean, nobody else, we finish the movie and then we show it to people, then nobody else gets to see it. Yeah. And you ask, you know, what time to get up to, I mean, I work well at You're night. You're not a morning no, person. No, I work well at late at night. This is my morning right yes. now. Um, and Chris is a morning person because, you know, he's a, he shoots, you know. Yeah. Um, but I realized that something happens about 
him coming over late at night or, you know, like Sunday evenings are really productive for us because it's not business. You know, he's now in the band somehow. And it's the two of us jamming, you know, and, and it's not, not like he's sitting there and playing an instrument, but we're, we're trying to construct an intellectual framework for what, what the music can do in this movie. The best thing I ever learned about how to do a movie is from John Powell. Um, who said, you know, which is about your procrastination, what people think is procrastination. <laughs> and John said to me once, well, it's, it's easy. You just have to get it under your fingers. And I think that's absolutely true because there comes a certain point where everything you play is on story, is in the character of that movie. And, but it, it takes a while to get there. You have to, you have to learn it. You have to learn, you have to invent, you know, the language, you have to find the words, you have to figure out what and how you want to say it, and you have to figure out how you're going to say it together with the filmmaker. How about Trent, you didn't, you didn't have the luxury of procrastinating though, because you were on Gone Girl, you were on tour, so that must have been, I mean, if you had the time, would you procrastinate and kind of let it go for a while? I, I work, I've learned over the years that a deadline is productive. You know, my, my new thing, as I'm old now, is before the sun comes up, I wake up, and my, my timetable is probably the opposite of yours. I'm, I start with a full bucket of ideas. Midday, I'm half, by the end, I'm defeated, and I'm ready to just give up and start fresh. And, and so my mornings are productive. But Where does that bucket of ideas come from? Well, what I've found is, for one, I think it's an intersection of a few things. Um, in, the, in my day job of Nine Inch Nails and that world, I would start songs by being inspired by sound, sound design, places, things, like the, the setting was important. And then somehow a song starts to emerge from that setting. And I have some friends who are producers who kind of browbeat me into thinking, no, to write a song is the opposite of that. Start with the melody and the chord. It doesn't matter how it's recorded. It doesn't matter what setting it's in or what that weird sound is in the background. It's about being able to play it on a guitar and sing it. And there's definitely merit to that concept, and I understand. Uh, but it's always been the other way around for me, where the setting and the place and the mood is, inspires what comes forth. And I found in my film work, it's replacing the idea that I would come up with as a song idea and trying to get in the side, in this case, David's head, and become familiar with the material. And then my strategy, which has worked pretty well, has been you know, read the script or the novel, become very intimate with what the spirit of the story is, and then spend as much time with him as I can to to hear what he thinks about it. What kind of film is he trying to make? And to pick up on phrases he might repeat or clues and breadcrumbs he drops. And he's never specific about should be orchestral, it needs to be bombast, nothing like that. There's just a, a feeling you get from him because I know he's thought about every aspect of what's happening, every word, every the slightest bit of set design detail. He's been touching it and knows it but he never tells us what to do. Then I just take that and try to um, not think about composing music for that film, but what, what feels like it's in that world? What's, what's that space feel like? And then there's a choice of instrumentation that usually comes, like what Hans was saying about, let's not do this, let's not use these things. I've got my palette of things I can do and techniques I've come up with, um, instruments I know how to play somewhat, some better than others. And then it's just kind of honing in on what that the story feels like. You know, is it analog and organic? Is it digital and icy? Is it human and orchestral? Is it broken down and dilapidated? And that starts to move things off the table. And what Atticus and I have done that um, has been very beneficial is the first thing we do after we've absorbed the material and absorbed David's input is sit down and very cerebrally say, let's not use this, 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 this. Let's start with these things and these techniques. And then let's just turn off the uh, consciousness and go complete subconscious, write, just write music and, and quickly. Within a couple of weeks, we'll have an hour and a half of music, of stuff, and float that by. And, and we feel, generally, I don't know if this is his version of what the world of the film sounds like, but it sounds like the story could take place in this, in this environment and judge the reaction, you know, and then turn it over to David's team, which is usually him, and Kirk Baxter, his editor, Ren Kleiss, the sound designer, and the five of us. 
have a conversation and you, you can quickly tell, hey, that feels, their, their eyes lit up about this stuff, mm, this stuff not so great, or not, not so appropriate. And that gives us enough feedback that now we can actually start. That wordy explanation is kind of where. <laughs> it's narrowing down, consistently narrowing down the palette of what you've, you're right, offering. Right, it's an intersection of what we think's right for the film, but also what we as artists are inspired by at that time. Like you mentioned marimbas, which is the, dilution of whatever's I've been interested, whether it be in rock music or something on the radio or a film I just saw or whatever may come in. I've noticed, you know, there's cycles of inspiration where I'm really into loud, noisy this, and now I'm into something. And hopefully there's something that's inspiring to me as a composer and artist that intersects with what I think's appropriate for this film I'm working on. And then we kind of... I think everybody it. here has some kind of connection to rock music, which is interesting because rock music is very front and center. It's very... It, grabs you and it's supposed to grab you, whereas film music kind of is supposed to do the opposite. Is that right? Well, no, I wouldn't agree with that. I wouldn't agree with that either. <laughs> I mean, uh, if you look at the last 75 fil years of uh, film music, there's a lot that would uh, counter that. That's a contemporary thing that I've heard very frequently. It's mm -hmm. not supposed to be noticed. Right. But why is it not supposed to be noticed? Um, I grew up on Alfred Hitchcock's films, Bernard Herrmann, and I noticed every note right. that Bernard Herrmann played in those movies. So I go, why was I supposed to notice it growing up, but now somebody isn't? Mm -hmm. So I think it depends on the film. Uh, there are films where the music is supposed to melt into the background more and become more of a transparent support. And there are films where clearly there's no reason why the music shouldn't be charging along as a major character front and center as much as anything else in the film. It depends on the style of the film. But as an overall concept, which I've heard frequently in the last 10, 15 years, I find it a little bit baffling why that seems to be the consciousness of music and film. But I don't think it's the consciousness of filmmakers. I think, I think it's, it's just an old... Yeah, do you hear that from people in the industry, or is it like no. you know people like me you know, doing interviews? I've I've been I've heard that a number of times. It's like, well, the music's supposed to not be noticed, and I go, why? I don't think you guys actually get a whole lot of time to talk to each other, right? You guys don't really but interact us, a whole lot. We all live in the same street and we <laughs> never see each other. So um, what's it like? Do you, is, it, is it good to actually talk shop with one another like this? I, I like hearing that, the, that there's, others, that there's yeah. insecurity out there. That's what I've gotten. Right. I've done three of these, yeah. and it's been really helpful to me to know that others are as insecure last, as I am. Last time we spoke about not sleeping, I remember we spent a lot of time right. talking Insomnia about Insomnia seems to be a common thing. Yeah. And, but but the, un, uh, the unsureness of how other people feel, I find uh, very helpful, because I'm unsure of everything still, and to know that others are often, sometimes, feel the same, I, I found very... But so don't, don't you think that's part of the job? I mean, no, don't you think yeah. that is part of the journey? If you were sure, if, if you know, the moment I feel sure, I know I'm just churning out stuff. It, it's a complete you know, balance it feels between dangerous. ego and because you have to be confident in what you're doing in order to otherwise you throw everything out. Right. So having that, but also being insecure about it too, because without that insecurity, you're not going to push the boundaries to, to look further. So mm -hmm. I think it's like riding a very fine line. I, I think, you know, the fact that it's a solitary business too. I feel fortunate because I have Buck, you know, we work, have a partner, you have someone that you work with. To have people around you is important because it's, uh, I don't know, especially out on the, the, the mountain where I am, you know, you, you begin to, you could easily go, go crazy. Yeah. So you, uh, do you guys have social lives when you're working? I mean, what are your, what are your lives outside of music like? Uh, uh, do they exist? That's kind of like a, a joke. Um, you know, I have a family that I occasionally see. Um, How do they deal with that? When you have a composer as a husband, father, uh, that's what I think you have to expect. You know, I remember saying to my wife, I says, you, it will be rather like you're a single mother <laughs> raising this child with my schedule. Says, yeah, I understand that. All right, I think we have time for one last question. And I'm curious, do you guys, do when you're working all the time, when do you have time to actually listen to music for pleasure? Uh, Trent, why don't you 
lead us off? That's a good question. I mean, I've been out of any kind of routine coming off tour where I still have a suitcase open. You know, at my mm -hmm. house right now, I've been off tour for two months now. So I'm, I haven't kicked into a real routine and I haven't had a good location and I don't have anything set up right now where I actually have time to sit and listen to music. I've been thinking a lot about that because I've tried to always have in my life a place that's the priority is to listen to music, not to do it while you're on the computer or something else, but you're like hearkening back to the old days of putting the needle on the vinyl. Focusing on it. And there's no cell phone because it didn't exist and I was actually experiencing music. Um, so I'm in between. I don't have a good place at the moment. Yeah. Airplanes? Cars would probably be the number Cars, one for me. Yeah. I think this comes back to your very first question, what's the hardest thing that we find? And that is, for me, it's managing time, you know, between, uh, you know, raising kids I uh, try to spend time with and uh, having a family, but also putting everything you need into the film, but even that, like breaking that up until, like how much time can you spend experimenting? How much time do you have to, you know, do you, do you have to figure things out? Um, and listening to music is, falls into that same category because I, I feel like I'm deprived in a lot of areas. And um, whereas I used to, you know, sit around and listen to records and mm -hmm. all that, it's just, it's so hard, I mean, the most is I'll, you know, sit with the kids sometimes and listen with them. But to have time, I always feel like, I don't know, right now, it seems everything seems so hectic. I used to hike um, with headphones on and listen to music, uh, but it got a bit weird because I'd get to the top of the hill and I'd be in tears because I was listening to Pacini. <laughs> and people would kind of look, come up to me and go, yes, the view is beautiful. And I'd go, what? You know, because I wasn't up there for the hiking, really. I was just listening. I mean, it was just a function of, of getting myself away, um, doing something I didn't want to do, which was hike, and something I did want to do, which was, you know, enjoy music, which was the reason we all got into it. I mean, this is, if you think about it, we're only doing this because we're trying to extend our childhoods, <laughs> you know, in some way. We all got hooked on the ability to be able to get such transcendental pleasure from music that nothing else could touch it. When you do listen to music, do you guys, do you listen to film music? No, fuck no. No? Why Not would you do that? <laughs> That's What crazy. do you listen to then? Hans, what do you, like, you well, it's a pleasure, you're okay. going to put something on, what's um, going to be? No, I go on these crazy, okay, so you, you, you guys are going to think I'm the antichrist here, because I go into these YouTube binges, where I go, like yesterday was a whole night of T-Bone Walker, but then that suddenly got me somewhere else. Um, God, I can't even remember. But it's, it's, you know, I like Paul. seeing people perform. <laughs> no, I like, we're talking about music here. Oh. Um, I, love, I love looking at performances. And I think uh, YouTube is fantastic because you can sort of, you know, it takes you to another place. And sometimes it's, it's people you've never heard of. It's the last thing I do before I go to sleep. Yeah. Um, the, the strange thing for me on, on Interstellar was because it was so much... You see, you see, here's the thing. That original thing that Chris wrote for me, he wrote it about a father and a son. And then he did a switch on me in the movie, It's a Father and His Daughter, because he knew that I would be writing about my son, Jake. So that journey, in a funny way, for the last two years was very much a journey between Jake and myself. I mean, he came to London, he came... You know, we, so he was part of a lot of the experiments. He was the first person to see the movie. So, I mean, this, you know, everybody keeps saying, you know, it, it's a loud score maybe, but it's a very little score. It's really, it's just very personal. I mean, that's what we kept going back to, that it's actually, at the end of the day, it's just myself writing about my relationship to my child. We're all obviously incredibly jealous of Hans and Hans' relationship with Chris. <laughs> that's that's yeah. the bottom no, line, yeah. No, nobody kind of gets that one. All right, I think uh, we're out of time. So I'd like to thank you all for participating in the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, the composers, Hans Zimmer, John Powell, Marco Beltrami, Trent Reznor, Danny Elf. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>